Okay, uh, welcome to Upstreaming 201. Um, happy to see so many faces that we're at Upstreaming 101, except for Tim's, he didn't show up. Uh, so, technical difficulties. We all know this always happens. Thank you. And we're back. Um, my name's Matt Porter. I work for Lenaro as a kernel engineer. Um, I'll joke that I, I used to do upstreaming in my day job on, on something else right now, but I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> so in this session, we're going to build a little bit on, on 101, was uh, really the generic of, of kernel, where to find documentation, how to, how to create, and all these things. We're going to look at some real-world examples by reading some email together, um, and also talk about some other things. And uh, um, it's a good way to see by example how things should and shouldn't be done. We'll talk about some uh, subject commit messages, how to respond to comments, um, how to just good etiquette on those things. Um, then we'll look at upstreaming a whole new platform. Um, and uh, like a, a new ARM SOC, at least in the minimal form, and uh, upstreaming a new driver, um, real-world examples. Uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. If you've got some different case I'm not covering, I'm always looking to hear different cases. There's all kinds of fun things to show off the mailing list, so I'd be happy to incorporate or we could talk about some of those. But first, before we get into examples, uh, one of, the, one of the things that's good to know, uh, if everybody's uh, uh, interested in ARM on Linux here, being a Lenaro event, and so if you're dealing with um, any kind of patches going upstream, you're inevitably going to have something that touches the ARM SOC uh, tree in the hierarchy. Um, and the ARM SOC tree has some very um, uh, stringent processes, processes and uh, they have a, a, a system by which they need uh, patches divided up into different categories before they go into the, the next tree. And when you're dividing up your patches and you think about how things get logically divided up, it really helps to know if you're going to touch something in ARM SOC tree and deal with those maintainers, you want to have things divided up in a way that makes them e uh, able to apply it. Okay, so um, when I talk about these different uh, categories, they have a concept of fixes, cleanup, SOC, drivers, boards, and DT. So some of these are kind of uh, uh, pretty obvious when you look at them. Um, if you have clear bug fixes, right, those are things that don't have to wait for a merge window. So it makes sense that they have this different topic branch to carry those. So if you have a bug fix, it better be on fixes. Okay, um, that makes it easy for them to, to deal with it, categorize it, um, handle their scheduling of doing pull requests, right, to Linus. Um, there's a, a cleanup category. This one's a little bit fun. Sometimes you do have some existing work and you, you're cleaning up the code. Maybe you're um, cleaning up formatting or rewriting the code more compact or something. It's something that already exists. You're cleaning it up. Um, that would go into this category. Uh, then there's a whole category of SOC, and what that is is in, within the ArchArm hierarchy, you have a number of machine directories. 
um, the code within, say, uh, like I co-maintain mock BCM and mock BCM, uh, anything under there would go into this SOC category. Uh, now, uh, there are instances where you may, because of um, dependencies, may need to, you have a new driver and there might be an agreement between the ARM SOC maintainers and the driver maintainer to take that driver through the ARM SOC tree, maybe because of some changes in infrastructure that affects it, and it may work better um, going through the ARM SOC tree. Drivers go through that next driver's uh, topic. Um, so you need to have those split out, um, but you probably did if you were already dividing up the driver. Um, then there's one that probably nobody here should deal with unless they're cleaning up old board files. Um, nothing new is going to use a board file, but if you were touching board files or something like that, perhaps you're cleaning up some of your own company's code that's in there in preparation for removing it, you might uh, send something through that topic branch. Okay, So things that would touch the board files have to be divided up into commits so that they can put it through that branch. Um, and then finally, DT kind of speaks for itself. If you're touching device tree um, files, uh, the DTS files, um, th those need to be split out separately. Um, they go through a separate topic branch. Um, now you see why I mentioned that. Um, if you weren't to divide things up amongst these boundaries, the platform maintainer is going to tell you, our MSOC maintainers are going to say, I need you to do V2 and divide these up. So if you, if you know of this, you can divide things up logically in your commits. Um, don't mix uh, a driver and a DTS change in a commit, right, is a good simple example. So being aware of this is good. You know, you'll get a nice kind mention if you forget or don't have it exactly right, but it's good to know why. Um, and then uh, if you want to see more details on these categories, um, this is the one slide um, two-minute version of it, maybe three, four minutes now. Um, you can go see um, Olaf's old um, uh, presentation from uh, ELC two years ago, something like that, 2013, right? And you can see a full explanation of why they do things that way and how that helps them work together as a team efficiently. All right. Let's get into some examples. I don't... Yeah, I didn't mess up the formatting. That's good. I had to change these to four or three slides because they're, they're, they're very wordy. If you're sitting in the back, it's going to be a little bit of eye chart. They work good probably halfway up, I think. Um, so we're going to read stuff together because I was saying people don't, in the, in the 101, people don't read the documentation. They keep asking, well, how do I do this? How do I do this? And it's all in here, okay? This is the submitting patches thing. I said everybody will read this first, right? Go read it. It's all there. You don't have to ask somebody on your team, well, how should I do my subject line? It's all here. And if anybody tells you something other than this, tell them they're wrong because that's the canonical documentation. If it's wrong, it needs to be updated. Okay? So, summary, no more than 70 to 75 characters. Okay? Key things. It shows you exactly how you form your subject line. All right. There's no guesswork involved here. Okay. It tells you how to move your version numbers forward, where you should use the RFC. Everything I told you in 101 comes right out of the documentation. Okay. If you forget it, you can just go read the documentation. Okay. So that's where you find it. I'm not making this stuff up, really. Uh, then submitting patches goes on, talks about commit messages. Okay. Um, they tell you why you have to have a good commit message. I kind of touched on this. Think about two years down the road, right? It's right out of the documentation again, right? Um, people are not going to remember why something was done, why a workaround, right? A subtle workaround. You've got to explain why you did something in detail, right? But you want to be succinct if you can too, right? You don't you don't want to bury them in a wall of text that people get tired of. As succinct as you can with getting those details over so that people preserve your change, don't undo it in some way, right? So I liked um, a well-known kernel hacker, Engel Molnar. 
he had a comment in a thread uh, I saw, um, well, a little while back now, almost a year now, and um, this this gentleman uh, submitted a patch, and it, it was like a real bug fix, but he's explaining in his commit message nothing exactly, right? You read what he says. <laughs> it says we want to calculate this. He gives us the thing. Let's make it four. So unless you really know that code and know the why, it doesn't really explain to somebody why this is being done. I mean, let's make it four, right? So Ingo says, here's good advice, right? It does this, it has this problem when something, we can prove this by doing C because D. That's very similar to my advice in 101 of explain what, why, and how you're doing something in the commit log, okay? Another way of saying that here, right? In this case, it was a, a bug fix type thing. But this is a classic example of why this actually, this thread kind of got held up in the fact that the submitter didn't want to listen to Ingo's advice, okay? We won't go into that part of it, but um, explain it correctly the first time or do your best on that, right? Um, you may get comments on, hey, let's update the commit log. You know, if, if there's some misunderstanding from the wording, it'll come out in the reviews, right? All right, so um, one of the things we've talked about in 101 is how to do summary and commit messages. So I wanted to show kind of a good example, right? Um, again, subject line, we talked about summary or, or, or the subsystem and summary. You see up, up there, you see patch, you see ARM, DTS, right? And then a platform, and then he's got just the description, okay? And... Um, Here's a case in the commit log where he explains what, what, why, and how, more or less, right? So on this platform, the, both those SDHC, all right, are 8-bit wide, so we need to pass the bus width property in to reflect it, right? And he tells why. Don't undo this, right? The message is don't undo this because otherwise we're going to operate in 4-bit SD mode, right? So clear, concise, right? Not... Not, you know, the bad version would be we need to update these and not say why, right? So it takes the time to put the sentence in saying what the problem is that he's fixing. Okay, so you're responding to comments. We talked about you're going to get lots of comments, right? It really helps. You don't always have to do this, but when you get a comment back, in this case, right, it's a posting... Um, add, add these devices to the, to the device tree file, right? And um, I got a comment, um, got a comment from uh, through writing that says these should be DC and, and HDMI. He wants them to capitalize a proper acronym, right, for a, uh, a term. So just letting the maintainer know that you're going to fix it pretty good ad etiquette, right? Because then they can catalog in their head, okay, they acknowledge my comment. Acknowledging the comment, it sure helps. You don't have to do it for every trivial one. Sometimes you'll have the same comment through a file, but, you know, we'll fix this and throughout, right? But just acknowledging that comment gets that interaction, right? Um, especially if if you're going to, maybe maybe you're going on a holiday and you're not going to get to the next version for a few weeks. You, you can at least go in and the ones you understand and acknowledge that you'll fix it, right? Fix this or address that. Good practice. Uh, clarification, right? It's not always going to make sense what the maintainer says. All right? Here's a good example of, of a uh, DTS binding uh, uh, being submitted. And um, the comment comes back, and it can be interpreted in any number of ways, right? Um, and, and, and it, it can be the case a lot of times where maybe you don't know the subsystem well enough, right? And they're, they're, they're describing to you some, do it this way, and it's some tribal knowledge, right? Sometimes we know things so well that it's hard to explain to other people. So you get this kind of vague comment, right? He does a great job of just saying, I'm just not quite following this, right? Just, you know, explain it to me in baby terms, right? And that's, 
There's nothing wrong with that. We're not all experts. Sometimes you're hitting a new subsystem. Go ahead and ask. And, you know, the follow-up was he got a very detailed explanation of the preferred way to do this, okay? It's okay to ask for clarification. Okay. So we've got to show you what not to do. Um, here's a, for lack of a better term, a character who was in a long thread um, about, <laughs> yes, I knew Mark would enjoy this one. And um, the worst thing you can do is insult people that are spending their precious time to review your code or try to help you of, you know, if approach is not the way the kernel community is going. Um, we're probably 50 posts into a thread and um, Tomaz says, um, you know, we, we need to move all this code to DT. That's, that's what we're doing in the kernel, right? And really trying to tell the person in another way. And so he insults him and everybody else, somebody who's respected in the community. Um, if you're having a bad day, this is not the way to end it, right? Don't, don't kill off your, your point or what you're doing if you don't understand it. Um, probably not something I would expect anybody here doing, but this is a sure way to never get listened, again, uh, listened to again on the list. Okay, so let's look now. That, that covered some examples, basic, you know, basic formatting and responding to comments. So let's look at um, how we would upstream a new platform, a minimal uh, support. Um, we're going to use the very creative name for our SOC, uh, Foo. Uh, and so what we would do is we're going to have our mock Foo directory, of course, for this amazing new SOC. So we need to logically split our work up, right? We're, it's going to be a whole patch series. We can't have a single a single patch with all of the stuff that goes in because it goes to all these different maintainers. And we talked about the ARM SOC categories. We need to divide things up in categories. So let's let's break it down and look at what you need for a new platform if you were doing that. So you've got some MockFu family-specific ops. You've got some, some stuff in there, okay? Um, that's going to go to the ARM SOC team, right? And you would learn that if you created the, the patch and divide it up and, and you ran check or sorry, get maintainers, it would spit that out to you if you were a newbie and, and, and didn't know that, right? Um, you're probably going to need a clock, well, you need a clock source driver of some sort. Um, and so um, you would go find out these two maintainers. That's a driver, so it needs to be a separate patch. That's a logical thing, one driver, one patch, and a new driver. Um, you may have a unique RQ controller, right? Um, so you've got a maintainer for that, and that's going to be a separate patch. Um, and then you're going to have a device tree binding for your platform. So every one of these uh, core SOC platforms has a device tree binding, right? Um, so that has to get reviewed by the DT team um, and, and the uh, ARM SOC team. Uh, and so uh, that's a separate piece. Uh, Let's assume you you have um, you touch multi v7 def config, right? You're you're going to be a multi v7 platform. We won't talk v8, but everything's kind of the same in this. It's just an example. Um, so you would have that piece, right? You touch the config file, that is yet another patch, right? All logically separated into different pieces, right? And then finally your DTS file for your platform, right? And that's going to go through the ARM SOC team. So the two things you're doing here is you're splitting to divide amongst maintainer trees, right, in this type of thing, all these different driver maintainers, and then you're splitting to divide according to ARM SOC categories. So the mock foo, right, has got to go through that SOC category we talked about. The DTS file, goes, it goes to the same maintainers, but it's a different category. And the reason it's a different category is it's a different logical change. It stands alone. Um, so you need to split to divide of those two things. Um, if you, uh, if you, and then further, you have that logical code changes. Let's say, um, let's say you were needing to make a subsystem change, right? Well, a subsystem change to make your driver work is a separate patch. It's a separate logical change. It needs to be reviewed separately, 
right? So that's the other piece you would do. In this example, we don't have that. So let's look at a real world. Um, this is how all winter, um, the first all winter uh, A1X, A A10, A13 parts went upstream in a blazingly fast amount of, of short period of time. Uh, so we, we, talk, we, we, we briefly touched on uh, cover letters. Here's a good example of a cover letter that tells the world what this multi-part series is going to do for us. Right? You, you'll find support for A10 and A13. He talks about the code names and why they're using SunXI, explaining all this. Um, again, to maintainers that may not have intimate knowledge of these parts, right? But they, they know their business. Right? And then finally, at the end of the overall thing, he kind of tells a roadmap, right? I mean, right now it's minimal. This is just what we need to boot, right? And, and, and they have their, their UART support, timer RQ. Um, and eventually we're going to add other drivers. So good, concise cover letter. It gets the point across. It tells what the overall thing does and where they're going. So let's see. That was version one on November 15th. All right. So in an amusing sort of way, um, Maxime's colleague, Thomas, <laughs> comments on this and suggests a, a different way to deal with the debug UARTs. Um, and um, so he makes a comment. Right? Maxime, he didn't even need to acknowledge it because within, let's see, that was Friday. Four hours later, he just posts another patch. And the way he acknowledges it in this case is he shows in his, in his cover letter, a good practice to have, and you'll see this commonly, a full change log of what changed from the previous thing. That lets reviewers see all throughout all those different patches, here's all the things I updated. And of course, there was other comments right, in this thing. Um, you know, the first one was, the, was him acknowledging and integrating a fix for uh, Thomas's uh, comment there on the early print case support. So there's, there's a record letting people know, communication, right, of, yes, I incorporated your changes. That's another way to do it if you're fast on the uh, spinning a, a, another version. And you can see it's patch v2.0 of 7 indicates your cover letter. Okay, so we're at v2, and just like that, um, on the same Friday, <laughs> Uh, Arndt Bergman says, eh, it looks great. Um, and then there's just a little bit of uh, discussion, but um, you know, the end thing is Arndt explains to a new platform maintainer what the preference is. Uh, we prefer a git pool, right, after things have been reviewed. This is a great example if you're not sure, right? Maxime, at that time, becoming a new platform maintainer, um, he asked for clarification. How do you want it? Just ask the maintainers, right? You're more than happy to tell them, yeah, we could handle patches, but we prefer you do a git pull request to us. And Maxime uh, responds in kind, sends a well-formed git pull request, and just like that, his the all winter support was headed into mainline. At that point, Arn pulled that pull request in, put it in next, and when the next merge window came up, it was sent to Linus. Okay, so that, like I said, that's a minimal, minimal example, and that's about as smoothly as you can ever expect anything to go like that, right? Um, keep in mind that that SOC, they they didn't go and drop, try to drop every driver, right, in there in in its current form. They went, they took the minimal set, started with that. I just needed clock source IRQ, right? My basic ops and mock food, or mock uh, Sun XI and a UART. I mean, that's the minimal stuff to see a boot, and then they went from there. So let's look at a driver, another common thing somebody might be doing um, to start. Uh, so let's say we had a watchdog driver, and I pulled this example because one of my former teammates, he, he did this one, it's watchdog's a pretty trivial type of driver, right? So if you were doing a driver, right, you're going to have a device tree binding, 
uh, again, we're assuming we're device tree type things. Um, it would be a little bit different in the server world. Uh, and then uh, if you had a watchdog framework change to make your driver work, right? Now you're going to, to, to Vim's tree um, through there. Uh, any kind of driver and build plumbing, um, that would be your kconfig and, and make file changes. Um, sometimes uh, some of the maintainers prefer that in a separate patch. Sometimes that's in, in your driver. Um, so, so the driver and build plumbing, so your driver, your kconfig, your make file, all one logical patch, right, in a normal case. Uh, if you have a def config update, um, sometimes you have a driver that you you want to have on by default. You you know can't default select, and um, in this case, you know some some platforms still have their own def config, not just multi v7, and they use it for production or something. Um, you, you would have that as a separate commit, uh, and then the DTS changes just like the ARM SOC um, or the new SOC example. Uh, same thing again, split to divide amongst maintainer trees, right? Because we've got stuff going. Um, to the mock maintainer with those DTS additions, right? You've got um, all these things going to the watchdog maintainer. Um, and then you, you're also dividing a specific driver features, right? So if you had to make a change to the subsystem, that's another little patch, right? Maybe there's a bug fix. Maybe there's an a expansion of an API that you've discussed with a maintainer. You pull that one out, and then the new driver stands alone, right? all separate patches. All right, so if we did that for this watchdog driver, um, and this is the real world example, we actually, in this case, um, Mark Smyre did this watchdog driver for the BCM 281XX family, and um, he actually, the watchdog was used for reset, so we already had a binding upstream. Um, we were using that for reset, a core code, um, so all he had to do his look like those two patches. Let's assume that wasn't the case. If we didn't have that, then here's the logical division, right? So that's what those pieces look like broken out if you did it all at one time. So you can see, broken up, well-formed. There's the watchdog subsystem label. Then below that, this is BCM281XX, add DT binding, right? Your description of that. So that's what your one line would look like if you divided them up correctly. So how do we create this? How do we use the tools? Um, the way we got to that in the first place was um, I, there's many, many different subtle workflows of how you can use these things. Um, this is one, one way. Um, use git format patch, right? Give the cover letter option we mentioned before in 101. Um, in this case, just we just output it to a temp file. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, and then uh, we just give, in this case, it was, it was developed against uh, RC1, and uh, we just give that range for the patches to the tip of our branch that we're developing off of, and the results in that directory are these patch files, right? So, again, just kind of reiterating, show you a real example that if you aren't using Git, You've got to use Git. It makes this workflow just work, right? This is how people communicate. Um, you will have, you will spend a, a lot of time. You'll waste a lot of time if you try to use some in-house um, SCM tool. Um, all these tools are well developed to make it easier for people to do things with upstream. So if we post this driver series. It's a pretty simple driver, so you didn't have to say much in this cover letter, right? Introduces a watchdog driver, right? And what's nice is if you use the tools, you get these things out. You get your diff stat out. So people can see, again, it's sort of like those change logs. I showed you the change log in the SOC version where you manually maintain that. If you use your tools, you're going to see in the cover letter, you're going to have a diff stat that shows the big picture for the whole series. Right? That really helps people because those things jump out to maintainers. Right? Um, how many lines are you adding? How many you know, removing? You know, if you made an error, someone's going to notice real quick, well, why is this driver adding 3,000 lines in a 
watchdog driver, right? And then they go review a little bit closer. So these kind of things are very helpful. Um, use a tool. I mean, you can go and post without doing this stuff, but the tools are there and does all this automatically for you. All right, so that was the, the cover letter. Um, so then Marcus, he, he posted in this series, uh, here, so here's patch one of two, the actual driver. Um, you know, if you're generating a thing with the tools, again, you've got the per patch uh, or per commit uh, diff stat, right? And then the, and then the, uh, the diff itself. Um, he has a, again, a well-formed commit message. There's not much to say with a simple watch there. There's nothing um, very interesting there. Um, again, if you're not familiar with the signed off lines, the different tags, those are all well covered uh, in the documentation that I've cited so many times in these last two sessions. I'll cite again, read documentation, submitting patches, submit checklist, okay? There's a full explanation of what you're committing to when you put your signed off, line, uh, signed off by line. There's a good history, you can Google for it, why we have that. Okay, and then in this case, um, because we work as a close-knit team, I reviewed this offline before he ever submitted it. He just uh, carried along my reviewed by um, on the driver when he posted it publicly for the first time. So that's, that's a good commit message. Those tags get carried into um, the, the uh, kernel log forever um, so people can see what the chain is of people who actually looked at it or acted, right, signed off on the, the patch before it made in. All right, so let's look a little bit at, at comments again, um, types of things that come in. And really what I wanted to highlight is there was a lot of discussion in this driver about how Vim wanted a certain thing done. Um, and there was some, some issues with, uh, that we missed with um, return codes, which is a pretty common thing. Um, really easy to get beat up on that because you, um, you know, nobody likes implementing error paths. <laughs> they don't get tested well, and so a lot of times the wrong things are there. So um, he gets a comment, and there was probably five, I mean, this is all summarized, there's probably five or six emails between Vim Gunter and, and, and Marcus coming to this conclusion of what the right solution was. Um, different set of comments. And so at the end of all that, he just replies to one of them and, and acknowledges, I will change that, right? So acknowledge, make sure you understand that. Um, let them know. So then when he, when he incorporated those, so that was a case where he actually just acknowledged and let them know. Um, he reposts cover letter, nice generation, and you can see there was lots of comments. <laughs> so just reiterating that you can have all the review you want, but you do not know how good your stuff is until you post it publicly and get reviewed. So that's a simple watchdog driver, and there was a lot of little things that needed to be updated. Right? So, And you can see he covered everything there so they can see all the things that he incorporated. And then sometimes acceptance doesn't work out exactly the way you want. So Marcus had um, some debug stuff as a separate patch. And um, just some debug register dump, this and that. Um, and the maintainer got, got to that point in the kernel process. We talked about the merge windows. And I think it was like RC 5 or 6. Man, maybe it was 6 towards 7. And... This is what he comes back with. He applied the patches. Because they were logically split up correctly, he dropped the debug part. He saw some issues where he wanted it done a different way, but the rest, the, the, the actual functional driver was able to go in. So we had the driver, and the debug part got dropped out. Right? It doesn't always work exactly the same way, but if you've divided things up right, you've gone through the process, you address things, we were able to have that driver in that merge window, and then we just went back and took care of the debug stuff on the next cycle. Okay, and that's it for 201. Anybody have any questions? Good, I can say again, you're all experts. All right, thank you for coming. If you have any questions, you can. 
grab me offline here. <laughs> Yeah. I just I just use